So um, just as a quick update or a kind of refresher about what this is going to be today, um, you don't like to do things super formal in the GVCC. Um, our goal is always to help you see what you can be. And so today we've invited five guests that are um, alum or friends of Carlson um, to help us um, uh, learn a little bit more about what the consulting space looks like. And so um, I'll take a moment to introduce our panelists shortly. Um, but we're going to spend about the first 30 to 40 minutes just doing a Q&A. And so we have some questions that we know are typically top questions from students that we hear in coaching meetings and in previous panels um, that we are going to share with our guests and we'll invite them to offer some answers to that. Um, and then the last 15 minutes we'll have networking breakouts. So Julie will open up breakout rooms and you'll be able to go in and connect individually um, with some of these um, the folks. And that's a great chance to you know, ask if you could do a follow-up via LinkedIn or set up time for a coffee chat or just ask a specific question that you may have about that organization or the type of consulting that they're doing. So while you are welcome to um, you know, ask questions during the panel, um, I just ask that you hold on to those specific questions for like a specific consultancy to wait and do those in the networking chat uh, towards the end. Um, and I think that's it, Julie, we can undo the screen share and um, we can see, get our panelists up here. So Julie has her work cut out for her today. She has to do a lot um, for us today, which thank you, Julie, as always. Um, so I am going to take a moment to introduce um, our first um, consultant, we're going to go alphabetical. And so I've asked um, our consultants to each share just a brief career overview. Um, and, um, and then they're going to tell us what their favorite road trip snack is. And you're always welcome as guests, or sorry, as the audience to judge, mock, support via chat, that choice of snack, of course, because we all love to have an opinion on things. So I'm going to start with Tom and then Kelly will be on deck. So Tom, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your career path? and that favorite road trip snack. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here with you today um, on this 40 degree Friday. Um, wow. I'm based here uh, in Minneapolis. Um, a little bit about my career path. Um, uh, while I was in school doing the Carlson MBA program, uh, I was working full time for United Healthcare. Um, I was there for over five years and uh, worked in their uh, kind of billing enrollment and operations side of things. Uh, so really heavily on the payer experience in healthcare. Um, and following my MBA, I transitioned over to Accenture because I wanted to dip my toes into the management consulting pool. And I have been doing uh, healthcare consulting for uh, Accenture for the last uh, you know, eight, nine months. And it's been a fantastic experience. Love that. I love um, that. My favorite road trip snack too. Um, I would have to say uh, like beef jerky, or if you get like the like the string cheese and beef jerky, like get some protein in when you're on the road trip. I think that's okay, always great. good. Okay, great. I mean, if people are in favor of that, they're welcome to offer that. Um, I think I, I support that. I support that choice for you. So thank you so much, Tom. Kelly is next, and then Nate will be on deck. So Kelly, why don't you tell us a little bit about your path, and of course, don't forget your snack. So important. Okay. Awesome. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, excited to see you. Happy Friday. Um, my name is Kelly Grouts. I'm a project leader at BCG. I've been with BCG for um, about three, three and a half years now. Um, I, prior to that, was uh, got my MBA uh, from Carlson in the part-time program um, while working at Target. So I was at Target for about five years in a variety of different merchandising roles. Coming over to BCG, uh, my first about six months or so was in uh, retail. And then from there have done a whole lot of different work, uh, but have sort of, you know, found, um, you know, probably the last two-ish years have been primarily um, industrial goods, uh, public sector, and aerospace and defense uh, types of work. Um, and I'm also, um, as I told uh, Bridget right before we joined, um, I, my, I have a daughter, she's turning one, so also happy to, you know, talk about sort of the experience of, you um, you know, becoming a new mom and consulting and all that, all of the good stuff that goes with that. Yeah. Um, and then my favorite uh, road trip snack, I was going to say combos, um, which is a popular choice in the chat. Yeah. 
which I feel like there could be a whole subreddit thread on that um, because there's a lot of varieties of combos there. So that's something you all can discuss in the combos breakout room, which will be hosted by Kelly later. So Tom will have the jerky and string cheese one. Kelly will have the combos room. So, and happy birthday to baby Chloe this weekend. So yay to baby Chloe. Um, excellent. Okay, Nate is up next and then Napoleon. Oh, actually that is, yeah, that's Nate's up next and then Napoleon is on deck. So Nate, We'd love to hear Thanks, you. Thanks, Bridget. Welcome, it's, welcome to the Carlson community. Thank you. Thank you. And it's wonderful to be part of the panel today. And I'll start with the important stuff. So I have a huge sweet tooth. So, oh, okay. so pretty much I'm any listening. type of candy I'm will listening. work for me. But I am very partial. And I saw uh, Carly, uh, yeah, I was a big fan as well, to Mike and Ike's. So, so that is my go-to. And in terms of my consulting background. So I started my career with Arthur Anderson, then 20 years ago, helped start a boutique consulting firm called Huron Consulting Group. So they're headquartered in Chicago. And then I ended up moving to the Twin Cities in 2015, still with Huron, and then transitioned a number of years ago to do something different that's, you know, in, in the consulting world, but, uh, you know, you know, kind of works in parallel to, you know, the management consulting space, executive search. So, so I work with Russell Reynolds and help lead their office locally. So we do consulting focus on talent. So executive recruitment, leadership and succession, and those types of things for our clients. So I still work uh, very significantly in the healthcare space, but also do work for, you know, consulting firms and, you know, across, you know, other industries for our local client base. Very cool. Very different too. Like a really interesting space. We're excited to learn a little more about that. And so, and nice to see the Mike and Ike's throwback represented here. So I think there's also a whole flavor set of flavor profiles that can be examined in your breakout room. So um, next up is Napoleon. Awesome. Um, hi, Napoleon. Hi, Bridget. Uh, hi, everyone. Awesome. Super excited to be on panel and to see all your bright faces on this really bright, sunshiny day. Napoleon Howell, I'm a strategy manager within Deloitte's Monitor Practice, which is our strategy practice. I primarily serve financial services clients, so asset managers, insurers, commercial banks. Uh, MBA alum at Carlson in 2019, been at the firm for going on three years now. Um, and then favorite snack road trip. I'm a huge Reese's peanut butter cup fan. So when somebody put in M&M's peanut butter, I love that as well. Um, <laughs> and just excited to talk to you about anything in relation to strategy consulting, but also I do a ton of things internally within the firm around DE&I as well as around thought leadership from an FSI strategy perspective. I love that. I love that. And I have to say, I feel like Napoleon, this is your time. Like for people who are like peanut butter, like chocolate peanut butter folks, like this is the time because of like the Reese's peanut butter eggs, like this used yes. to be like the season, you know, it was like, okay, our candy has finally arrived, but now I feel like they make them for like every, but it's okay. It's your season. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then finally, Ayush, we're excited to welcome you as well to um, the, the Carlson community um, from West Monroe. We'd love to hear a little more about you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ayush. Uh, I'm based in New York. Uh, I'm a senior manager with West Monroe. Uh, I have about 10 years of uh, consulting experience in different capacities, including Monitor before they were acquired by Deloitte, Accenture, and IBM. Uh, and uh, sort of my area of focus is around digital strategy and uh, digital product enablement. Uh, so that's what I focus on within West Monroe, but I also have uh, a lot of experience around uh, AI deployment, AI strategy deployment at different clients. Cool. My favorite uh, snack, I, I love fruit. So I would say watermelon salad or watermelon would be my favorite snack in that regard. <sighs> You had to bring in the healthy and there, I know there's folks in the audience that are like, yes, this is great. And I'm like, okay, that's good. But I do love watermelon too. Um, so awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So first things first, I asked the panelists before they joined us today to, um, you know, think about, um, you know, and to think about like, you know, an interesting consulting or maybe a boring consulting engagement that they were on um, and be able to offer an overview. Because again, our job in the GBCC is to help you see what you can be and really get a sense of like, what does 
the life of a consultant look like? And a day in the life is one thing, but really understanding like the scope of a project and the pieces that are in it, I think is really important. So we're actually gonna go in the same order again um, with you know Tom, Kelly, et cetera. And I'm gonna ask you to share an overview of a project um, that you have worked on so that our audience can get an understanding of what that actually looks like. So Tom, you're up, man. <laughs> A project, a project. Razzle dazzle us with all the fun things happening in Accenture. All the fun things happening. Um, pretty much a, a good overview of one of my first projects uh, when I came on there was, uh, and this is going to come from a healthcare lens. So sorry for folks that like don't, uh, aren't interested in healthcare, but that's just kind of where like my experience is. Um, but if you have more questions about that, like don't hesitate to ask. Um, but I was working on a project uh, for an intermediary technology company between CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and a health plan. And basically, my job was to create efficiencies and streamline the process for all of their files and documents um, that go between the two. And the intermediary was really trying to organize and make sure that they kept all the billing files together, the enrollment files. Um, they didn't lose um, patient or member information, that sort of thing. And so I really had to look um, through a lens that taught me to uh, be sensitive to uh, what the health plan wanted, but also the regulations for CMS um, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid again, um, and the regulation turnaround time that they needed for that. So I think that that uh, really taught me um, how to be aware for both for two different parties, not just one party that you're consulting for, but you technically have two clients, even though you're only working for one. So uh, really gave me a good experience, worked with a great team, um, had some um, good uh, gain some good project management skills, but also good communication skills uh, when you're presenting to different parties. That's awesome. And to reiterate, did you know exactly how to do all of that work when you started? So thankfully I had some experience with that from my prior role at United Healthcare, which is why they really brought me in. Um, but when you go to a new firm or I transition into consulting, they want you uh, they have their own approach. So you have to be open um, and allow for some ambiguity and really understand the scope of what you're doing uh, so that you can solve the actual, you know, solution and, and ask a lot of questions, do kind of go through the five whys and root cause analysis, those sorts of things. And yeah, so there's always learning that's happening. There Absolutely. Too. That's okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we, I mean, and, and part of the reason, in addition to your sparkling personality, um, you're always cool with TV shows. I also brought you on the panel because of your healthcare experience. So, I mean, that's a shout out to the healthcare nerds in the audience. So, um, okay. So, um, Kelly, let's hear from you about one of your engagements that you've had in the last few years with BCG. Yeah, of course. Um, so a lot of the work that I've done at BCG is uh, helping our clients on sort of large scale transformation efforts. So really kind of thinking, you know, with the, you know, the, the leaders of the organization, what is sort of that, that five year journey um, and how do you sort of, uh, you know, bridge a, a transformational path um, across your organization and sort of thinking about how, you know, set that strategy and flow that down um, through the implementation so that you can you know, drive like really complex um, you know, ch changes in an organization. So I think that's like been the common theme across most of the projects that I've had at BCG. Um, the, my, my current project is for a, you know, public sector uh, government uh, client, and we're helping them think about sort of the, the way that, you know, the, um, their sort of uh, work that they do is essentially a portfolio of business units. So really trying to take that like commercial best practice lens to understand you know, what sort of um, pieces of, of the business are, are areas that you want to grow over, over the next five years? What are sort of areas where you want to drive efficiencies and become, um, you know, kind of drive a, a cost transformation in, in the way um, we serve, um, you know, other, other stakeholders, our, our, our customers per se? Um, and then are there certain kind of things that we can stop doing or where, where should we be divesting um, work that we do or assets that we have? Yeah. Um, so that's been sort of the, the theme of the, of the project. 
Um, and then, you know, I, th I think a lot of, it, you know, re uh, leading a team of about um, four people, and then, you know, we kind of ladder up to a, a broader transformation effort um, across a few different teams. Um, and that's sort of the, the scope of, of my current project. That, that's kind of a big project, Kelly. I don't know anyone else in the audience is like, oh God, that sounds kind of gigantic. Um, so mm -hmm. does that, um, have there been moments where you were like, uh, this feels kind of intimidating or overwhelming? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I've, I've learned, I think like, you know, coming into consulting, you know, the, the first couple of times you get on a new case, you're like, oh, wow, this is totally different than something I've ever done. I don't think I can do this. But I think very quickly you, you become comfortable, um, you know, being a little bit comfortable out over your skis per se, um, but it's, it expands your comfort zone quickly and you, um, you kind of draw those themes across. Um, and I think being able to like drive like synthesis and sort of that general problem solving and the kind of ability to walk into a new situation and say like, okay, here's sort of the, the themes and insights um, is, is huge. Um, and then also being able to like tell, tell the story, like there's so much complexity out there. If you can sort of boil it down and say, all right, these are the things you need to know. This is what matters for your organization. Like that skill like really transcends anything. And I think um, allows you to like be able to walk into a new situation and kind of get to that insight. I love it. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Okay, Nate. Um, as someone who's in a really different kind of consulting, you know, than I think what our students have historically been exposed to, hence why we want to do in this group today. Um, can you tell us about an engagement that you've worked on? Yeah, so, so everything that you'd see in the executive search world and at Russell Reynolds, it's going to be people and talent focused in terms of the advisory work. So what I thought would make sense to highlight is some work I've done with a local board related to their succession planning and leadership succession more broadly at the, the company. So it's a, a company called Inspire Sleep, which was a spin out of Medtronic. So they were private and IPO'd in 2018. And following the IPO, they needed to think through, okay, we're now a public company. How does that change how we should think about the composition of our board of directors? So thinking through how does private equity transition off the board? What type of skill sets should we bring onto the board to have the, the right combination of experience and other things that ultimately are important to our investors, important to our business and everything else as we look into the future. So the company's done extremely well. They're about, uh, they're based here in the Twin Cities. They've got about a $7 billion market cap on 300 million in revenue. So I think that the punchline there is high growth, very high expectations from the market. So, uh, what you know, I did with uh, my team is meet with Inspire's existing board of directors, and it's a high-powered group. It's chaired by uh, a woman that uh, actually Marilyn Carlson Nelson, uh, oh, no. you know, who everybody uh, at the Carlson <laughs> School should be very familiar with. So she chairs Inspire's board. Uh, there's other uh, people on the board like Gary Ellis, who's Medtronic's former CFO. Uh, so it was you know, them uh, and the other members who ultimately helped inform our thinking in terms of what should we prioritize as we think about bringing on new board members to replace the private equity investors. So ultimately, you know, we focused on uh, you know, an importance uh, to improve the diversity of the board. Uh, so that being a continued focus for them, but then also public company CEO experience and direct to consumer marketing experience. So we've helped them bring on people uh, you know, that add that type of experience. So Shelly Broder, who's the former CEO of Chico's uh, was placed onto their board and that's a recruitment we led. And then prior to that, she led Walmart's international business and then uh, Georgia and she's got a, the last name that's almost impossible to pronounce, but she's the former chief marketing officer of Estee Lauder. And then, you know, now we're continuing to work with them as they think about, you know, another board succession project. So that's something that we're working with them on now. And then also thinking about leadership succession and, and adding a, a key role to their leadership 
group focused on investor relations, just thinking about you know, some of the things that they're going to be focused on as they you know, continue to grow their business over the next several years. It's um, interesting to hear kind of the parallels between what you're doing and what Kelly is doing, because it's very much that broad, high level. You have to understand the strategy of the organization to be able to get the right people in place to do that work. And so it's a nice continuation. Thank you for sharing. Um, that sounds fun. And I love the Carlson connection, obviously. So, um, OK, Mr. Napoleon, what in the heck do you do at Deloitte? I mean, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you guys doing over there? Uh, do, doing taxes. a lot of different. You just do people's taxes, don't you? <laughs> no, not at all, actually. So, <laughs> context-wise, yes, yeah, we're segmented between our tax, audit, advisory, and consulting practice. So, I sit within our consulting practice. Um, as I draw a reference to so like really interesting project, one comes to mind where we were hired by this Fortune 50 insurer to say, hey, help us understand what our North Star vision is from a data analytics perspective and help us define what our strategy should be, but also help us like stand up an operating and interaction model that can facilitate long-term success. So this one, it, it really ended up turning out to be a pretty meaty effort. Um, typical type of strategy project layout where we went through current state analysis, really try to identify what the op opportunity areas were, define key strategic initiatives, prioritize those initiatives in relation to what drove growth based on, on defined value drivers, and then really built out a five-year, three to five-year roadmap to help them get there. One of the interesting parts as we went through the exercise was it's really defining what the operating construct would look like in relation to their current like executive team members that sat within the data analytics world. So they didn't have a CDA or chief data analytics officer. They had a CDO, chief data officer, and analytics kind, the capability of analytics kind of sat across like a couple of other executives. So as we had to build this operating construct, the politics that were involved in ensuring we got the balance between, hey, this is what role of CDO should look like. This is who, from a capability management perspective, should take on that role. Uh, it was very, very interesting political I, conversations, as well I was like, as interesting what, is the Minnesota word, but, um, not meaning interesting. Um, and uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> um, but interesting. That, or, sorry, uh, I appreciate that you highlighted. You sometimes dip your toe in dealing with the politics of an organization. Absolutely, absolutely, and it was interesting politics from the perspective of. Like our direct client sponsor was the CDO, but as we thought about what does target state structure look like in relation to our strategy, like capability wise, there were capabilities that kind of moved out of his shop. And so we had to navigate the socialization and the, hey, this is what is best for organization and this is how we're going to get there and it, it ended up working out, but it was a very interesting po uh, project that had a lot of facets that I think are, are pertinent to consulting success. I love that. Again, also building on what kind of Nate and Kelly have been talking about as well. So that is fantastic. I, you don't have to keep it going in terms of the politics and the people, but we are excited to hear about um, an interesting project that you've had in your consulting career that you'd love to share with our students. Absolutely. So um, I've also done a lot of uh, transformation work similar to Kelly. And uh, one of these was with a pharmaceutical company, uh, they, uh, the problem they were facing was a lot of their pipeline of, uh, you know, drugs in the R&D space hadn't panned out in the last 10 years or so. And they felt that the health of uh, their R&D pipeline relative to their competitors was uh, deteriorating. So our ask was to evaluate the sort of, you know, like uh, do a outside in assessment of uh, the health of their R&D pipeline and then recommend uh, some potential acquisitions that could help strengthen it uh, in key areas around oncology. Uh, so it involves sort of doing, uh, the project involved doing an internal assessment. We did a bunch of interviews to understand the current state and the pain points. Uh, then we also did external interviews and research around, uh, you know, where, funding is flowing for you know, future research around oncology and cancer research, uh, what best in class looks like, define the framework for that, uh, and use that framework to assess the health of uh, 
both their and some of their like key competitor pipelines uh, to give them a score and then identified opportunities uh, you know, in, in some of those smaller competitors who they could go after and recommended, you know, what would be sort of the risk associated with each of them. So we helped sort of like prioritize, uh, uh, you know, their investment strategy and a roadmap for what they should do in the next two years as they engage with the bank to close the transaction. I love that. I love hearing, it's like you helped kind of um, dissipate the fog and create some clarity for them about how to, to move forward. So that's awesome. Um, okay, so we're gonna, I have a, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions out there and I'll just ask one or two panelists who are wanna answer that to just um, signal. Um, one of the, uh, when I'm working with students and they'll say, you know, I'm really interested in consulting because I love problem solving. That's the really, a really common answer. And I'm guessing all the panelists would agree problem solving or untangling the Christmas lights is kind of part of the job. Um, but I would love to know, any other specific skills that you would recommend um, or traits that have really served you well in the consulting space? So for our, our audience to be considering, in addition to being effective problem solvers um, and honing those skills, are there any other recommendations that you would make, make for skill or competency development? I can jump in on this one, Bridget. Uh, a couple of thoughts here. Um, thought one is, what I've learned about being consultant, you really are required to be disciplined and tenacious and have stamina to push beyond like boundaries that are, are self-perceived or, or otherwise, but it requires you to be an athlete. And so often when I talk to folks, I think like being an athlete, not necessarily background in athletics, but being flexible and agile and adaptable to problems that you didn't predict were going to arise, but you have to solution for that's a critical like component to success from a, a consulting perspective. I love that. Thank you. That's great insight. I can um, add another perspective too. I think one thing that helped me uh, when I started is making sure that you were clear on the expectations of what your role is and what your team's role is um, and be prepared for some uh, amount of ambiguity uh, that you don't know where that is. Some people don't like ambiguity. They like to know all the details up front, but sometimes there's a scope shift. Sometimes uh, you don't have all the details, um, but ask what kind of the expectations are up front and learn to be okay that you don't have all the details right away. Um, I think those are uh, kind of just some things that hit me hard and I had to make sure that I was disciplined like Napoleon said and just make sure I, I know what the goal is and the objectives are. I love that. I appreciate those sentiments. I think they echo each other and, and parallel really well in terms of that being flexible and agile and disciplined. And if they almost seem contrary, but they're all necessary. So I appreciate that. Any other thoughts from, from the audience, any other from the panel on that one? Kelly. I hit on this briefly earlier, but I think the, the, the like key one in my mind is storytelling because so much of what consultants do are going into an organization and like using data to get that to insight and then tell like a story. And, you know, I mean, like, you know, it's, it, this is transferable across like all clients are engaging consultants because they're going through some sort of business problem. And they're probably, you know, something that they weren't able to solve themselves or something that sort of transcends multiple teams, companies, what have you. Um, and so much of, I think, what we do is how do you break that down into the story and then lead people on like a change effort? Um, so like really kind of crafting that, like, I mean, people will say like things like an elevator pitch or talk track or like um, getting to the so what, like all of this is directionally, like, how do you like take information and, and, and turn it into story that's going to kind of lead people on a path? I love that. I love that. So think flexible, agile, discipline, um, having that stamina, um, comfort with ambiguity or just experience working with ambiguity and maybe not as comfortable with it, but getting yourself exposed to some ambiguity um, and um, leaning into the change management aspect too of the work. I love that. Um, I also wanted to um, ask if folks are um, seeing any trends um, around the type of work that you've been doing, um, as I was chatting with the panelists before we came in um, to the full group around, you know, we've just seen consulting change 
from a recruiting standpoint over the last few years. Um, and also we just know the lifestyle of consulting has shifted a bit with um, that little that little pandemic thing that's been trending. So um, wondering if folks can offer any insight about you know think of shifts that you've seen in your work environment or in the type of work that you've been doing for the last few years um, that you would like our students to know or just to be mindful of, of like this is what life has kind of looked like for us. And maybe it's firm specific, but also just things that can um, folks know about, um, you know, just to learn a little bit more about maybe what's trending in your worlds. One of the biggest things I have seen change over time is clients really want industry expertise. So when I started 10 plus years ago, you were supposed to be a generalist, but more and more, uh, you know, they want to hear how have you done this similarly for others in, in my industry or you know like sort of uh, bringing those use cases to example so if you can rely on your industry expertise uh, that is definitely one and then the other uh, i've seen this a lot in the way we have started pricing our deals is can you showcase value uh, tangibly in what you are recommending once you get off the engagement and uh, you know if they're not seeing it they're not coming back uh, to buy repeat purchases. So that's the other big emphasis around the end of the engagement is how we can articulate uh, the value that they will get. And it's like 10X of the fees that they pay or whatever. Oh, that's very interesting. That's very good. Thank you. Um, other thoughts on this? Um, trends, things that you're seeing, things that you um, were surprised to see have shifted or trend, what's happening more in your space? Uh, in the healthcare world, um, for me, it's all about consolidation right now. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, folks might be familiar that CVS and Aetna came together, uh, but all across healthcare, there are uh, hospitals that are building ambulatory surgery centers or are kind of uh, bigger um, payers that are getting into buying transportation companies um, to make sure that their members um, can get to their appointments, uh, things like that. There are skilled nursing facilities that are coming together with rehab facilities. So we're seeing a lot of consolidation within the healthcare world. Um, and to kind of answer uh, Andrew's question in the chat, uh, a class that helped me out with that, um, I got my MBA in finance and uh, M&A, mergers and acquisitions, helped me a ton with that because uh, we went through a lot of scenario analysis and examples of um, two big time companies really merging, um, but then also having discussing takeovers, hostile takeovers. Um, when you have a big company with a small company, um, name changes and branding, and how do you get that out to consumers and members? Um, what, you know, how does that change your revenue flow? Um, things like that. So I think consolidation was was very big and uh, has been and will continue to be in the in the healthcare industry. That's a great insight. Thank you for that, Tom. Yeah, thought here, uh, Bridget. So it's yeah. interesting confluence that I'm seeing between the strategy world. So think your chief strategy officer and then your technology world, your chief technology or chief information officer, and them really trying to get to the place of how do we balance the work that needs to be done and the strategic initiatives with one another because they're so intertwined now. So we don't go to, when we go to clients now, it's no longer we're going to solve a strategy problem in the pure form that we had done before. It's always a technology or a digital component that is infused in it. And therefore skills and capabilities that we bring to market has to have like a breadth and a depth that really weren't required before, right? Uh, you talked about the the just generalist type of form of strategy consultant versus now there's there's still need for that generalist especially in the strategy world that understands frameworks approaches etc but the the capabilities and the knowledge from a technological perspective is very very important and value added as well um so that's a very interesting uh dynamic that's live and just proliferating yeah, it's definitely, um, it, it enhances, it seems like where maybe there had been walls between those areas before, it's more like curtains between them. And mm -hmm. so we can't kind of have those siloed out. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, I want to hit in about one more question before we're going to let you all get into um, some smaller breakouts so you can chat with our consulting panel. But um, and this isn't a small question. It's a big question. But I'll say from the coaching standpoint, you know, one of the things we hear from students is a strong interest in consulting, but a concern about the lifestyle. Um, now, so a concern about how to get into the field. You know, what is casing all about? Do I have to do casing? Why? Why do I have to do casing? Um, and then, um, you know, what is that lifestyle actually about? And what does it truly, truly look like? Because I think there have been some conflicting messages over the last few years, especially with COVID and travel and non-travel. So I'd love for folks to just be honest with us about like, well, why, why does networking and casing play a part in the um, consulting space? And then what does that actual work life look like in terms of time and hours? Yeah, I'm happy to dive in and provide well, some quick thoughts on, on this. So it, it gets back to something Kelly had mentioned earlier in the conversation where you've got to be comfortable being out on your skis. And, and I think the faster you can be comfortable in uncomfortable situations, the better advisor you can be. And I think a case study helps one assess how the, you know, the interviewee can put structure around something and, and dig in and ultimately, you know, advise a client, you know, in a way that, you know, is going to be influential and, and, you know, move the needle forward. And, and I think one of the uh, kind of getting back to the lifestyle piece, and I feel that this is consistent uh, across firms, is that the delivery model has changed. So obviously, when COVID hit, everybody stopped traveling, and you know, there has been some travel, uh, but nothing like what it was before. And I think that that's a change that we're going to see now. I think there will be travel, but in general, clients have figured out that our consulting partners can deliver very effectively from their home offices. You know, I can, you know, interact with them by video. They don't need to be here every day. And it's kind of nice to not have to pay for all those travel costs. So I think from a delivery perspective, you know, in particular for, you know, kind of the, you know, uh, you call it consultant through manager, senior manager levels at firms, there is going to be much less travel. I think there's still going to be travel strategically to build relationships and to, you know, roll up your sleeves on, on certain things. But, but ultimately, I think a lot of the delivery will continue to take place, you know, in a remote way. Thanks, Nate. Appreciate that. So I, and also to say like casing as an interview tool isn't meant to just be painful and for people. It's, there's a purpose behind it is what you're saying too. Yeah, agreed with everything Nate said from a casing priority perspective, forcing you to help go through the analysis that's needed um, in a structured format as you approach clients. But from a networking perspective, one of the fundamental, fundamentally important like roles as a consultant is to build and foster relationships at the client level, as well as internally within the firm. And that's the only way you really drive success as a consultant, right? Whether it's like selling additional work, making sure that you're the trusted advisor as you go through um, different phases of an engagement, that's critical to success. So pressure testing it in business school um, is very, very helpful so that as you transition, it's more of a fluid exercise versus something that new um, as you navigate these huge organizations. Great, thank you. And Kelly, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so on the, on the case example, and I think I, I agree with everything that's said of, um, you know, the, it's sort of a, a, a microcosm of the work that we actually do, you know, which I think you kind of learn as, as you go in. And for me, like the first few cases I did were rough <laughs> to say the least. So I, I would also, you know, as you kind of go on your casing journey, um, it, it takes time, it's, it, you know, it, it's gonna feel rough at first and then you just kind of put in the work and, and you'll get there. Um, and it'll start to feel comfortable. It'll sort of like click in, in how um, it works. And I think it's very sim. It, it, I mean, in many cases, it's, it's literally just like a microcosm of the of the work that we actually do, and and the way we actually unpack uh, problems. Uh, you know, that are you know, I kind of know the answer or know the context coming in the door. Uh, on the sustain, on sort of the the work life balance, you know, perspective. Like similarly, like you know, obviously remote for 
a couple of years, we, like with the casework I've been doing, I've been sort of back to, you know, some travel uh, for a couple months now, obviously not during, you know, the kind of January COVID spike or anything. Um, yeah, so we, we have been sort of doing um, a combination of, of some weeks on the, the, the client site, more for kind of key meetings or kind of key, like, you know, times we want to be sort of embedded with our, our client counterparts. Um, so that probably every every couple of weeks, I would say. Um, we've been doing some co-location in different BCG offices and getting that collaboration with our team. Like, it's like amazing how much, like, literally just getting in front of a whiteboard is like a game changer to really, like, get to the insight, get to the ideas as a, as a team. Um, so we have been doing some travel for, for just the, the sake of teaming. Um, and then some sort of, you know, off weeks, like this week, I've been just working from home all week. Next week, we'll be sort of co-locating with my team in the Minneapolis office as well. Okay, great, right, thank you. Um, so as we are, I want to I, I want to make sure you have time to connect um, individually or to connect in small groups with our consultant panel. So, um, you know, why we want you to go into breakouts, um, if you have specific questions that you want to ask about, you know, the type of work that um, one of the panelists is doing or the organization that they're in, or if you are such a huge fan of their um, road trip snack and you're like, I just want to meet my people. I need to find my Mike and Ike folks. I need to find um, my, my cheese stick folks. I, I'm a fruit lover. I need the fruits. Like I want to talk to people, um, but it's a chance to just get a little, you know, kind of do some small group time. You can move through breakouts into different rooms. So um, Julie will pop on in a second and kind of introduce you all to how we're going to move you or how you can move into breakout rooms and select them. Um, Julie will also give us a notification as when we have about a minute left um, or about probably one minute left in the breakouts and then you're welcome to come back to the full group and then we'll just do a quick close out and thank you to our panelists so um so julie are we good we are i'm in the open rooms for about 11 minutes you'll see a timer at the top so you can manage your time um, but like bridget said you'll have a you know sort of a 60 second countdown before we all come back in the room um so panelists thank you for being here you're going to automatically move right into your rooms and students you'll get a little pop-up and you'll be able to choose which room you want to go to So that is open now. If anyone has any trouble finding that breakout room box um, or menu, let, us know. Um, let me know. Feel free to unmute yourself or send me a chat and I can help people move. Yeah. Take advantage of this time to chat, chat, chat. Jason's like, don't let it be me with all these people in here alone. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, I got. <laughs> no worries. Take care. Okay, here we go. Okay. And then Sarah, if you have any questions, just let just feel free to unmute yourself or put something in the chat, and I can help. Hey Brian. Hi, Brian. Hello. How's everybody doing? Good. Oh. Yeah, I figured I find I don't I never get her on camera, so oh I figured. Oh my goodness! Hi Luna. Oh my goodness, she is so gigantic. Uh, yes. Oh yes, my goodness! Look how snuggly she is. Well, yeah, kind of. I had to pull her over. I was she was laying over on the other couch comfortably, and I picked her up and brought her over so I could so she could meet everybody. So yeah. How's it going? Goodness. Good job. Best moderator in the office, I think. No, no, no. The competition. No. You're, you're way, you're way more uh, conversational. I'm just all business when I go do mine, so that's all right. I'm all sizzle, no steak. Um, oh my God, Luna, look at that face. What a cutie. Oh, yeah, she's man. very doodly right now, which is yeah. good. So yeah. uh, we shave her too. She gets to be very much a poodle when she's shaved down. So now this is like the perfect length for her. Um, her hair is long enough now where she comes in just caked in mud in the backyard. So and so like little Swiffer sweepers. Yeah, it's yeah. so beautiful. <laughs> the towel is ready I, to rock. So yeah. Yeah, 
it's just, I just have rugs. Like the whole house is just rugs at this point. And I'm like, just, just stay there, yeah. just stay there. So yeah. Um, any thoughts on this so far? Any thoughts? Look at Napoleon's got, of course, Napoleon commands an audience. He's got everybody in his room. He's so good. I like, uh, this is related more to Brian's yesterday. I liked kind of the dynamic of the Amazon panel yesterday with like yeah. all the like interplay between everybody that knew each other and kind of that was fun dynamic. Random. Yeah, it was completely random that two of them were, that four of the were on similar teams. So two were on direct teams and two other were. So it was really great to ask a question and then they could bounce it together instead of having to have all five people going through and answering every question, it seemed to have more conversation. And yeah, Aaron mentioned that was like, I wasn't sure how a couple of the panelists would be. And you could see they were totally in their comfort zone because they kind of had a accountability buddy that could kind of talk about what they did and how they did it and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was great. That's helpful. And Ben's doing well. So good. we had to do, we had to do like a blood test today and they now do think he has an ear infection, which they didn't catch on Tuesday. And oh, he has two in his ears already. So it's just like, man, just ridiculous. Oh. So, yeah. I, I I thought you weren't supposed to get ear infections if you had that's, two. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah, I, thought, I, feel like, I feel like we had to fix that. Yeah. Hmm. Poor kid. I know. So, but the fever seems to be dipping, hopefully. So you should be okay. So, yeah. You're gonna keep uh, recording through this. <laughs> great. Yeah, I suppose I could stop that. Thank you. Oh, it's great. Everybody wants.